Hi, everybody. Will here with this week's interview chair. This week we have Miss Patricia Proctor. This took a long time to get this organized, but it's going to be worth it. Hi, everybody. Will here with this week's interview chair, and I have my favorites, and she knows it, <laughs> Miss Patty Proctor. How are you, Patty? I'm great. How seeing you, I'm even better. Thank you, Will. I'm good. <laughs> oh, it's great to see you. We True. <laughs> so how, how, how are things going? Things are going great. Um, I'm walking on beaches, reading books. Retirement is good. Although people ask me that, and it's like, well, who doesn't like retirement? For the love of God, yeah. So I'm great. Thank you. Oh, good. Excellent. All right. Well, let's get rolling then. Tell me how you got started in the sport of dogs, please. So long ago. I, th I, th I think it's not pen and ink. It's rock and chisel. Um, <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Uh, um, I remember as a kid, and I don't know how my father got started with him. We had a pet Labrador. It's kind of one of those, Angus was his name, kind of one of those field dogs, leggy. I started with a Labrador, too. That was my first dog. <laughs> what better? Yep. What better? I love him. Yeah. So, so I was a leggy dog, just a nice, good old family dog. And I don't know how my father started in obedience. I just remember him obedience. And there was this um, uh, club on Long Island and it still is in existence. Suff Suffolk Obedience Kennel Club, Dog Club, Training Club. I forget the last two. And it was near our house. And it was famous, um, like everyone on Long Island from around would flock to Suffolk Obedience Training Club. I do remember as I was growing up, a lot of the trainers there um, were not only AKC judges, but kind of famous. Yeah, I, I, I guess they were really good. Yeah. And my father started in obedience. Well, you know, he would take us kids, you know, over to some classes, probably to give my mother a break. And um, long story short, and it was so nice in those days, people were very trusting and um, would just start handing us a dog. Here, do you want to handle this? Here, in obedience and in confirmation, one night a week, the dreaded Suffolk Obedience Training Club had a one-night confirmation, even though it's confirmation. And... People would say, oh, here, take this dog, or here, take this dog. And so, yes, I showed an obedience a little bit. I got, I don't know, a degree or two on an Irish water spaniel and a couple obedience degrees on a couple of Kerry Blue Terriers wow. that I ended up co-breeding um, with these ladies. I uh, ended up showing most, most of the time in junior showmanship with the Kerry and it just progressed, you know, as as we all do. We just, all of a sudden, you're at dog shows. And How you're old were you at this point? Sorry to inter interrupt. How old, me? How old were you at this point? Oh, 11, 12, 13. Rock and chisel. <laughs> <laughs> But, and that's what I said, you know, even though, you know, you, you was just a kid, people were really, really nice. Here, take this dog, you know, or maybe they just saw uh, that I was able to do it. I don't know. I don't know. I was a kid. And um, so it just progressed to dog shows. And uh, in those days on Long Island, a million match shows, you know, yeah, you were going probably to more match shows than you were to confirmation shows. And in those days, obviously, the confirmation shows were way down in number compared to what they are now. And um, just progress, you know, into confirmation from obedience for me 
from obedience to conf- to junior showmanship and confirmation. And it just kind of had a life of its own, you know, and, and, and you got involved and I enjoyed working with the different breeds. Um, and, what was and your obviously- first breed that you showed yourself that were you own? Well, it's funny. I have a picture of myself. Oh, maybe I was like 10 years old. And it was a mat show. And there I am in my shorts holding this um, red English cocker, you know, like this. And and I, I don't know what I was winning. I do remember in junior showmanship, my first win was with this Labrador, Angus, Oh, wow. so there I am. wasn't showed us. Your Labrador wasn't a showed up. <laughs> well, this one wasn't either. But in junior showmanship, you know, who cares? But there I am, you know, with this top line, and <laughs> and I'm holding the tail, and the tail is like that, and the you know. and the judge, and I remember it was a novice class, and it was at Putnam, and the judge was John Ashby's father. Oh wow. Because in those days, during lunch, is when junior showmanship was. You grab a dog, any dog, go in, um, um, show, give the dog back or whatever. But this happened to be our own family pet. And um, and, and there I am looking like a dork. Um, but, but yeah, as John Ashby's father and handlers just took the time, which was very nice of them during their one hour lunch break to jump in a ring and judge junior showmanship. That's what we do up here still. <laughs> still. Lucky you. Lucky kids. Yeah, we still do that. That's wonderful. Yeah. You know. And then, you know, you're going through school and I, I, I worked for, I was very lucky. Um, it was funny. I showed in junior showmanship and um, still with handlers doing it. Roy Holloway was the judge and he gave me the governor's trophy for best junior or whatever in, um, at the Hartford show. And we took a picture and I do have the picture. We took the picture. Well, you have to send and- that to me. Oh, okay, I will. Took the picture, and he turned to me and he said, do you want a job? He was my (laughs) first boss. Like, it wasn't even in my head to go work for a handler. I don't, don't, it just wasn't. So I, I, he was my first boss. I worked for him on weekends. And how old were you at that point then? So I want to say like 16. Yeah. And I didn't. Of, of the three handlers I worked for, I never worked in their kennel. And I think my mother was very smart in in keeping, you know, being diverse in their in her kids' lives. You know, having a home life, stuff with school, you know, going to college, you know, and doing all of that. But yet, you know, heading off to shows on the weekend because clearly I was interested in it. And not even for any kind of a future. I just, I just enjoy doing it. Mm-hmm. So I never worked at any of the handlers' kennels. And but what was good with Roy <clears throat> is he had a van, and it was quite amazing. He had a van load of best in show dogs, and what an experience! So anything from a Czech Collier's Bouvier to a pug to a best in show bloodhound to a best in show case. And I mean, just chock full of these best in show dogs, which was fascinating to learn from. He was a good boss. He was a very Long good boss. With Roy. Maybe, maybe three years. Oh, that's good. Yeah. And then the Forsyth hired me. And and again, I didn't I I I would go with my friend to Pat Cruz to the shows. She would drive. She lived on Long Island. And off we'd go. And I'd meet up with them on, on the weekend. And um, that was a good experience. You know, you, you you learn you learn throughout what works for you and what doesn't. You know, and and every every handler has a different way, but it's very interesting. The Forsyth um, put a, put a lot of their assistants in the ring, 
you know, so it wasn't that you were just the person back at the crate, you know, if all of a sudden a boxer needed to go in for reserve or especially in boxes, they would have, you know, two open dogs, Brindle and two fawn open dogs and whatever. And if one of them was off somewhere, you got the other one, you know. It was quite a handling experience. It was probably overwhelming at first. Then I don't know why, but no, it wasn't. No. I don't know why. Dogs and just how how famous I felt they were. And uh, absolutely, total respect, total respect. Um, and it was interesting because both Bob and Jane. Um, you would listen to them, and even though uh, clearly they were incredibly ex- successful, they both they would talk to us differently. They would, you know, Janie was more the educator. Bob um, um, would quietly just say one or two words, and you got it. You know, he would see something you're doing, you know, that needs tweaking, and he would say, "Look at that." And you got it, you know. Whereas, and and they were they were they were great. It was it was truly a, a good education, you know. Oh, was there a big team when you were there? Like, who, who yeah, the- yeah. yeah. Um, so Kathy Kirk basically um, managed the schedule, which she was very good at. Um, Bobby Fowler and Bobby Fisher um, were there. Um, Um, A friend of mine, Pam Hall, was there. Um, Hanky, they had Hank, this elderly gentleman whose job was just to stand there and take care of the one old English sheepdog, which was great. I usually got the coated breeds, like Afghans and poodles and whatever. I don't know why. I guess I did it okay, I guess. And... um, um, yeah, it was a, it was a good batch. You saw some. They had some people that maybe um, there was a Nancy, this Pooley lady, Nancy McGarvey. Uh, that's it. Oh my God, yeah. she was fabulous. Uh, uh, and 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 all those boxers and all those wooden crates, and you're loading the bluebird, and. I'm struggling with one end of an empty wooden crate. She would lift the wooden crate <laughs> with the boxer in it up the stairs into the bluebird. And it's like, God bless. You know, keep her. You know, we need her. <laughs> yeah. Nancy McGarvey will. Good on you. I met she she was really, really good friends with Garrett. So I got to know her through Garrett. And I learned a lot from Nancy. Oh my yeah. God. She was very Nancy clever. was good. So level-headed, so nice, a really good poolie breeder, you know. She was, um, she was good at setting up setters. That's, I remember her showing me how to set up a setter. Like she was wow. Yeah. yeah, she was. Not, and, and she, I got along with her a lot because she was pretty funny, you know, and, yeah. and uh, that's just how I get through life, you know. And, you know, and then the stress of all the madness, you know, just one funny comment here and there from her would uh, make my day get me through the next hour or the boxer entry or whatever it was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember, and obviously everyone knows Mrs. Porter. Um, so Janie obviously always had an Irish setter. Mrs. Porter put her name on that Gordon setter legend of Gale. And, and I don't know why. And I forget how it morphed into it, but um, I was Legend of Gale's group handler. Okay. I guess the dog didn't work well for Bob because he would be standing, and Janie always had the Irish, and I was the legend. Uh, lucky me. I mean, incredibly I lucky me. You know, um, and the few times that I would win the group, um, um, and Janie, like, getting second, it's like, yeah, I got a stink eye from Janie, but you know, there I am. Yeah, it's Legend of Gale. He's a beautiful dog. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Very lucky. Yeah. It was a great experience. Yeah. How long were you with Bob and Jane? I want to say um maybe two, maybe three years. Well, so I'm not good on time. Years yeah. Of consistent. yeah. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not good on time, Will. As you'll find out in this interview, it kind of just all kind of runs. Yeah, I just runs. Yeah. Um, 
And during college, um, I was training um, an owner. I, I'm one of the charter members of the Owner Handler Association of America. My father and Charlie Westfield and Sir Owen Hudson started. And, and I was training um, classes, confirmation classes out of Long Island. And um, I'll never forget Dave Roberts, Ellen Roberts' mother, Dave Roberts' mother-in-law, Flo Harmon, came to the class with these two little toy poodles. And I don't know why. It's like, oh, love it would be a challenge. Um, and that was my first poodle. One of those puppies was my first poodle, which then uh, Bob helped me with trimming. Um, and and um, she she didn't she couldn't finish her she had a slip patella, but um, that was my introduction to poodles, and that's when I went to work for Richard Bauer. Clearly, clearly, I needed help, um, and 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 again, just on weekends, and quite the experience, um, and and I did that through college. And um, I stayed with poodles. I found it a challenge, and Lord knows, as you know, they're wonderful to work with. Um, bred, a, bred a couple toy litters, um, bred, a, bred a couple um, standard litters, but I had, it's like, that's too many. Toys, I wasn't getting what I wanted on a limited basis in that size. Mm -hmm. Standards, who wants 12 puppies? Not me. So I went back down to minis, and minis kind of is where I focused for a couple of decades. How long were you, I'm going to, I'm going to go back a bit. How long were you with Richard? He was one of my favorite. I, I loved Richard. Incredibly talented. Incredibly talented when he when he he put the work in and of course michael poisserat was was working living at his kennel which is annie's old kennel michael poisserat and jimmy mitchell were there so it was it was quite the group yeah. yeah i'm guessing i was there maybe another three years i'm guessing wow. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah I know. Wow, you know. <laughs> well and and lucky me yeah. A, lucky me that I had those people to, to learn from. Sure. And B, whatever possessed me to say, I need to learn, I need to learn, I need to learn. You know, um, and, and maybe it was beca because I went to college and I have a BS in education. Um, so and, and even at that point, I wasn't planning on hanging out a shingle. Do you, I, yeah. It kind of, everything in my life kind of morphs. You know, yeah, yeah. So, but eventually I did. Yeah. And so, when did you do that? How old were you then, roughly? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Maybe 26, 27, 28, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I still had my own. And throughout that whole time, um, being a professional handler, I still had my own because, as you know, it's just a fabulous breed. And um, I ended, I had, I had a couple of really good clients um, and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. And that learning process, I'll never forget being at Bryn Mawr, obviously with PCA, so huge entry, thinking, um, okay, I'm still learning. And I had a white mini that I co-bred with this lady. I still wasn't professional handling. And I don't know what made me, I'm in the ring in the middle of an open bitch class. And I look to the, my, my right, and there's Frank, and, Frank Sabella and Janie, and Wendell, and I look to the left, and there's Richard, um, I, I don't know who, and I'm thinking, I remember thinking, oh my God, what am I doing in here? What am I nuts? <laughs> You know, but but I just kind of hunkered down. But clearly from Bud Dickey, clearly from all of them, I took pieces of what worked for me. Mm -hmm. um, and, and take it or leave it, that's how I rolled with it. 
And uh, I learned to groom them better and condition them better and show them better and breed them better. And, you know, all of that. You know, I was very lucky, Will. I was very lucky. And just to grow up to have those people around you working and getting to watch them work, I'm sure it was amazing. Like being up here, I got to see them once in a blue moon. Like yeah. I was up here, which was great. But like I, I'd go down there and I'd be like I was in Hollywood, you know. Like, oh yeah, my. yeah. Oh, remarkable. And trust me, the the respect that I I, I had for them, um, you can't measure. I mean, you just stood there sometimes and you just watched and you learned and you listened and you know, you just watched how they worked the business, how they showed those dogs. I mean, smoothest hands in the world, Bob Forsyth. You know, whenever he showed those whippets, you know, finger under the chin, and you didn't even see him behind those dogs as large as he was. You know, it, was it was fascinating, very impressive, and I was incredibly lucky. Yeah. Yeah, and I was, yeah, just, I guess, being at the right place at the right time in a part of the country that was embedded with those kind of people yeah. that had enough shows. Um, a friend that would drive me to the shows until I got my driver's license, you know, that kind of thing. It just kind of played out. And I just, I just rolled with it. I'm very lucky. There's no doubt about it. Uh, and uh, That's why when I see assistants and juniors nowadays, you know, even if I said all that to them, it wouldn't make a dent because they they don't ex they didn't experience it. They don't know who these people are, and I get that, but it's a shame because it's invaluable. Yeah, I talk to handlers now because it's assistants are in shortage right now. It's hard to yeah. find an assistant, and that the, the first reply is always, "Well, how, how much am I going to make a day?" I never like I I was talk, talking to I can't remember me it was Wayne. I don't remember being told how much I was being made. I was being paid ever. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I remember with four sites, it was twenty five dollars a day, and I thought I was rich. It's like, oh my god, twenty five dollars a day. And even if you went to buy a twenty five cent Coke, you had to get a receipt. Uh, <laughs> and and Lord knows that's about all that they would give you because the classic Janie story is anyone who worked for them i'll never forget it was it was a hot day we're outside obviously we un, they unloaded under the tent and we're all working and janie announced okay lunch is ready well her idea was of lunch was i know i know <laughs> what did she make <laughs> so grabbed a rinsed out Dog dish, feed dish, kind of swiped a little. I happened to watch the whole thing. Uh, whatever I was brushing, I, she was in my line of fire. Uh, swiped it, threw a couple cans of tuna fish in there, took the mayonnaise, put a few globs of that, swished it around, put it on the top crate with a loaf of bread, and there it sat. <laughs> There it sat, <laughs> uncovered, July, outside, there it sat. And it's like, yeah, no, even me. I'm not hungry today. No, thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I've never heard that one. I've heard, like, the bologna spread. I've heard the pizza spread. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. I love those stories. <laughs> Warm tuna with mayonnaise. <laughs> flies, whatever else, hair, whatever else ended up in it. Yeah, July. Yeah. You know, and, and, and it almost was a running joke. Anybody get sick yesterday? You know. <laughs> <laughs> but God bless. You know, I, yeah. I, uh, and I remember, God, she was a trooper, Janie. She truly, truly was a trooper. When she was pregnant with Susie, I was working there. And, and she was pretty huge. And um, she worked that Sunday show, I believe, had... And I remember um, we were all doing the running. I think she ran maybe one boxer around, so specials or whatever. And, and due date, like, next week, well, it turns out, I think she had Susie on a Tuesday. Sure enough, she was back at the show that following weekend. I'm sure, yeah. 
God I remember bless. telling when, when Alice and I were together, I remember her telling us that story. And then when Allison got pregnant, we were at a dog show and she was just sitting around because she was pregnant. Well, and I had a conflict with the Airedale special and she took the Airedale bitch in and she, someone was running up on her. She turned on that person. Can't you see I'm pregnant? It was pointing her home at them. <laughs> but it made me think of Janie when she was doing it. Like, that does it. Yeah. yeah. I, you got to give her props. I don't know if that was the healthiest route to take, but you got to give her props. Oh, well, for sure. Um, well, yeah. She's probably in great shape, but probably, the, you know, probably helped with the birth. <laughs> uh, we were all scared. We were all scared, you know. Just, it's like, oh, my God, she's going to have it, have her kid in the aisle. But what, <laughs> what do we do? What do we do? I don't want to be there. Because <laughs> you know she would. Oh, one ambulance sure. right here. Give <laughs> me some old towels. <laughs> So yeah. funny. I was thinking about Jeannie this weekend because of, uh, the iris that I used to show, the owner was down in, in, the, from in the Maritimes. And I was down there judging my very first group this week. Oh, and she, oh. It was excellent. She gave me all these photos and one was of Janie giving the iris hitter, And it was a note from Janie thanking the owners for the picture. Uh, I have that. So I started thinking, so I, I have that now. So. <laughs> Maybe, how nice. Yeah. How wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's great. Um, Off topic, I'm sorry. <laughs> see, now you're babbling. Yeah, instead babbling of me. That's no. good. Wait, I, I, need, a, I need a water break for all my babbling. I'll have a Tim Horns coffee break. This should be gin, but no, it's just water. Okay. <laughs> so you're on your own now showing dogs i am and, how and, that and every weekend have a kennel? did you did you lease a kennel what did you do no well at first i had a very small kennel uh, on long island and when i moved out of there donald Sturz was my when he first got his first poodle I mean, he grew up with Goldens yeah. and, and like worked for various handlers, but he went the route of getting a poodle. He got a, he had Ray Scott, Ray and Ginger Scott got an Alakai poodle from Wendell, a bitch. They bred that to Ed Jenner's command performance, had a litter. Donald got one, Mike Scott got one, and there were these guys who used to show in junior and still were showing in junior showmanship with their, their poodles. So I knew Donald from those handling classes, and he said, "Can you know? Can you teach me poodle?" So he ended up working for me, and um, that in and of itself was a great experience. I mean, there's somebody who you could totally trust, even though he was a, um, a late teenager. And um, but he knew dogs. I mean, having grown up in it too, and and whatever. So, and I had a couple other girls. Um, 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 one um, Debbie, I ended, I showed for, but she ended up working for me. I was very lucky that I I would take them off with me on the weekends, and um, we'd get it done. And and yeah, you know, so I'd have a van full of poodles at that point in time. Um, and and in itself. Oh my god, I remember those days. <laughs> oh what was I thinking? What yeah. was I thinking? But I'm not having dinner tonight. That's what you were thinking. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. And we were younger. And in those days, and it's like a big no fair. In those days, there were no generators. You stood after judging and brushed that hairspray out. And but, uh, yeah. And so, so, you know, imagine what I could have done if I could have, you know, washed bracelets, fresh wash bracelets and blown them out. No, there was no, no awnings were just starting. Never mind. You know, we're unloading under the tents. And it's like, okay, young and foolish and had the energy then. So that's what you do. Um, but I really, I enjoyed that for several decades um, um, until, and even with that, it's so funny, timing is everything, everything. So obviously after many, many, many poodles and many, many shows and a couple of decades, and I was breeding some poodles or whatever, sure enough, holding those heavy clippers, my hands are pretty wasted. Mm-hmm. And now, of course, they have those cute little d- 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 clippers. Oh, I, and try going back to the plugins. Oh my God, you can't do it. You just can't. Oh, had to do it. That's what we had. Yep. That's what we had then. 
Ah, and um, so so it was a lot of work. I got, I, no regrets on it. Um, it just was what it was then, you know. But it's like the second you leave poodles, they come out with that cute little. <laughs> they also came out with fluorescent pooper scoopers. I would have killed for a fluorescent pooper scooper. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> yeah. So I ended up, I ended up kind of, kind of drifting back to to like all breeds and and i also took over um when my my brother was dying he had um he obviously was heavy into english cockers and he had this really good client co-owner of of a lot of english cockers um and um so when he was no longer able to go in the ring he kind of turned it over to me um, which how lucky was I, you know, to walk into that kind of breeding program. And I, you know, I took over a special of his and, um, um, yeah. You want to hear a funny story? Yes. A totally, that's what here. a totally illegal, illegal, funny story. But now that I work, don't work for the kennel club. So my brother's sick. And he had a very famous English cocker named Pac-Man. Beautiful dog. Yeah, very well. Uh, yeah. And he was showing, and I had a dog I was showing at the same time because they love showing. We showed them as veterans. You know, I, I had one I showed at PCA in, in Pac because he wanted to go, made him happy till he was like 15. Scott had an English cocker that he kept showing and showing. And his goal was to break a record for the highest number of group placings. So Scott's in and out of the hospital and and living in Florida with my mother. And he calls me up. He says, okay, I'm back in the hospital. But Pac-Man's entered in Florida. Okay. No, he was living in Pennsylvania. I'm sorry. Pac-Man, there's a show in Florida I was going to take Pac-Man to to get one more group placing, and that would have broken the record. So, of course, I drop everything. I say to Danny, you're on your own this weekend. And, uh, of course, full support. Go. Buzzy Leonard was going to pick me up at the airport. I was going to stay at Buzzy's. I'm going to show the dog, get one last group placing, go home, break the record. Yay. Whatever my brother wanted. So I tootle off to Florida with Pac-Man. And um, I'm, I'm, I'll never forget the night before the show, um, my brother calls me, and, he, and I see who the judge is. But my brother calls me and says, okay, Babby and I, Babby Tongren, Babby and I were just talking, no problem on the group placing. Swear to God, she's <laughs> doing the breed and the group. No problem on the group placing. Okay. <laughs> Night before the show, and I'm Buzzy and I are kidding about it. It's like yeah, whatever you want, Scott. So, so I'm grooming Pac-Man in Buzzy's garage, and I, I, know, I had to run to the bathroom or whatever. I said, Buzzy, keep brushing. So I come back and brush it. Buzzy's like sheet white. I said, What? He said, Patty, Pac-Man only has one testicle. Call my brother up. Um, something you didn't tell me? <laughs> he said, well, yeah, he's old. It kind of shriveled up. And he said, it's only Babby. I, okay, okay. Go the next day. There I am. Win the breed. Babby doesn't even go near a testicle. Uh, she's worried about her next cigarette. I mean, she was fabulous. So off I go in the group. And Gavin had a really, really, really good Vizsla at the time. He was specialing. So there I am in the group. Just give me fourth. Get, just give me fourth. No. She gives me the group. My head immediately went to... No, who's doing best in the show? <laughs> Bob Moore. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> I'm going to get disqualified. <laughs> the one placing is going to get taken away. Oh. <laughs> oh, my God. What to do? Buzzy is pacing. Oh, my God. 
Gavin is giving shoot me looks like, well, who do you think you are coming in my night? You know, the whole thing. Obviously, only Buzzy and I knew about the one testicle. So it's like, okay, okay, okay. And and at least I I was comfortable enough with Bob Moore that I could. And so I said to Buzzy, I'm going to babble like an idiot. So he comes to the dog and and he said to the table and says something about nice to see you down here. I literally just hung on pretending I was holding the tail up, even though it stayed up on its own. I just hung on. And he to where the testicles testicle was. Yeah. He just brushed past it and done and done. The dog's in best and show he's got two testicles. <laughs> Illegal, the whole thing, from the phone call to Babby to the one testicle to that, but the judge not touching it, the whole thing made the the dog got his record. So yay, it made my brother in the hospital very happy. So all good. Exactly, that's a great worth story. It. worth the sweat. Oh sure. my god, <laughs> that's a great story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it's not shocking to a lot of people. I'm sure that it's been done before and will be done again. Okay. But for me, it was like, oh, my God, Scott, what are you doing to me? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so you're still showing dogs. Um, how long did you show dogs, Preston? I stopped in 2007. So I started in the 60s as a kid. And but professionally, I, as, as oh, professionally, yeah. no, I, I guess it was like 19, like a 76, 77, something like that. That I hung out my shingle, did the poodle thing, hands went crippled. Um, they look good now. <laughs> yeah, I'm not holding that damn big clipper <laughs> with the wire. Um, um, Went back to like all breed handling, and I was very lucky. You know, um, I, I, I have to honestly say, and it sounds so sappy, I was never one with a goal to win, like to win best in shows and win Westminster and all of that. To me, I was very happy. I didn't want that pressure. Let me just plug along. Sure. Just plug along. Maybe and happens, right? Huh? And if it happens, it happens. It happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But I was never, uh, I, I, that was never like a mindset. And I was very lucky. I had some really good dogs, whether it be a pug or or that English, a couple of English cockers. Um, I had a really, really good Sharpay. Um, had a couple of good poodles. Um, it, it was like a smattering. Mm -hmm. And that was enjoyable because it, it, it got me, after a couple decades of poodles, it got me into other rings. So it was, it was viewing different dogs and different judges and different exhibitors. And um, it, it was a pleasure. Oh, um, but uh, the AKC had called me to do the field rep job um, three times, and the timing was just right the third time to finally say yes. Yeah, and 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 again, that sounds awful that they called me, but it is what it is. I I didn't I didn't have a resume in or anything, you know. Uh, it was funny when I was talking to Daryl Hayes, who was head of the field staff, and. I said, well, I don't know any rules, Daryl. And he said, well, have you ever been suspended? And I said, no. He said, well, you must know some rules. I mean, it's so classic and so funny. So I, I did take the job. And it happened to be in the same area I was in, which was fine by me. Yeah. And, um, um, yeah, fast forward to, you know, Daryl um, retiring and I was called on a Friday while I was at a show in Edison, New Jersey, saying, OK, I'm turning judging over to Tim Thomas. Tim, Tim became a rep right after me or maybe a year after. It doesn't matter. He says, I'm turning judges over to Tim. I'm turning the reps over to you. What does that mean? He said, oh, you'll do the budget and you'll do this. They're, they're yours. And on Monday, they were mine. And it's like, 
what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> no idea what that means. Uh, um, <clears throat> but um, Tim and I um, uh, relied on each other a lot because he was he he was navigating what he had to do. I was navigating what I had to do. Um, and with the support of people like Adina Sprung and and field st- some of the field staff, um, you, you muddle through it. You do it, you know, trial and error. You do it by experience. You do it by just doing it. You know, what's working, what's not working. So, you know, I appreciate Daryl for that, but, oh, my God. Oh, they're yours on Monday. What? <laughs> <laughs> well, you stepped up, that's for sure. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whether I liked it or not, there it was. Oh. But it, and it was a lot, and and I I, I knew uh, I'm just one of those responsible people. So so I mean, I even I, I I kidded them. I you know I felt like a mother hen half the time. And as a matter of fact, as a retirement gift. They gave me this this fabulous sketch um, done by another friend of mine, Patrick McManus. And there's a big hen and all the little chicks. Yeah, that was me. That was just how I, I rolled. I mean, total respect That's for, for the team that I put together. There were some firings, you know. Um, Life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know... I I never appreciated good old boys. I mean, I was raised with that, mm-hmm. you know, and you saw it. And, 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 you know, like as a kid, it's like, oh, that's just the way it is, whatever. And, um, but as you grow up in life, you realize, for me, it was like, you yeah, know, I'm not happy with good old boys and, and turning your head when something should be done and ignoring other stuff. And so when I became head of the field staff, I said, but I'm, just how I roll, take it or leave it, doing this straight, but doing it straight. So those that didn't do it straight, um, ended up not working for the company anymore. You know, I had to do some hirings, a lot of hirings. I kept saying, if I have one more interview to, to do, I'm, I'm going to shoot myself. But um, I'm very proud of the team and the integrity that they have and the um, knowledge and the experience that they have. And um, they're doing a straight job, and I'm proud of them. It's a, it's a hard job, um... It's a hard job, which you don't realize until you're doing it. It's another until you do it. Um, it's a hard job. You know, you have to keep a poker face. You have to do it do it straight. It's a lot of, I mean, the main job is to observe and report. So there's a lot of reports after the weekend and a lot of responsibility. Um, but if your heart's in the right place, and again, that sounds hokey, but but. You're here because you love the sport, so you want other people to love the sport, and you want the sport to stay, you know, above board. Um, but yeah, it's 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 not an easy job, yeah. not an easy job for me. It ended up being like a twenty four seven, but it is what it is, you know. Um, so, so um, but then I had to stop. <laughs> I had to. I had to. Um, I was going to stop the year of um, when COVID hit. As a matter of fact, um, uh, a lot of my um, passwords in my old um, AKC laptop was retired 2020. Well, COVID hits, and it's a tough time for everybody. And I had to lay off 11 out of 13 of us. And um, that was awful. Mm -hmm. It was a phone call um, I'll never forget. And Tim had to lay off five, I think, out of eight, I think. Both of us, for a couple weeks leading up to that dread, those dreadful phone calls, we'd call each other, what are you going to say? How are you going to say? I don't know. I mean, how do you lay off these people that you hired? You know, that, that. Um, have, um, they're going to go on unemployment, and I mean, I mean, the whole country was like that. So, uh, um, and as shows, as shows 
um, started up again. I was bringing them back. But that was no time for me to retire. That would have been wrong. And and I don't think there's one of us that would have retired right after you lay 11 of your staff off. So got them back, hired a couple more, and then left. Yeah. No, it was, that was the right thing to do, to stay on board until... It is. Like I said, all of us would have done that. You know, I, I mean, that wasn't even a thought for me, you know. Um, and, and the COVID, navigating that whole COVID thing and um, the staff, the staff who was still on board in events and in judging and whatever, you know, trying to figure out, you know, what, how to, how to, how to, incorporate COVID restrictions into show setups and judging. And, you know, we, it was a lot, a lot of phone calls, a lot of Zoom meetings, a lot just to keep the exhibitors interested, keep the judges. I know for those couple of months, uh, Mark DeRosers was the other, the, the other rep because he was the in-office rep. He and I were the only field reps. And I know I did over 100 interviews, Zoom interviews, during those couple months um, to keep the judges engaged. Right. Uh, so you want it all aspect, you know. Uh, yeah, and the events department, uh, club development, they were great on keeping contact with, with clubs to keep, you know, don't give up, we're with you. You know, we, it'll, get, it'll happen, we'll get back. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm glad it all worked out, but I was pretty tired. I was pretty yeah. tired. Yeah. 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 So, so, yeah. You only had two retirements. You had retiring from professional handling, retire from, from being the rep, and now you're starting to judge? I am. <laughs> and it's funny. It shows you, showed me, not you, but it showed me um, – the downtime that I needed, um, I thought would be maybe a couple of months. Um, cause, uh, uh, Dennis Sprung and Gina DiNardo wanted, wanted to use me at their roaming meet the breeds, which I am doing now, but I kept saying, I, leave me alone for a couple of months, leave me alone, you know, and, um, those couple of months turned into to like nine months. I went to one dog show. Wow. I had no inclination of going to shows. I just like, like, it's over there, I'm done. And the one I went to was only to return some AKC stuff to the new rep and to this person or that person. Um, and I, I, finally, I finally applied to judge. Um, after nine months, I said yes to Dennis and Gina on the Meet the Breeds because that's only you know, six, eight, six, eight times a year. I have one coming up in Columbus, Ohio. And my job um, is just basically to walk around and be supervisor and make sure it's running right and whatever. Um, and in between, yeah, I applied to judge. I finally, I finally did. Certainly didn't even rush into that. <laughs> Yeah, so I have an assignment here or there or wherever. Um, what are you judging? Well, when you leave that department, there's a policy that you can either get a whole group or you can get the um, number of breeds equivalent to the largest number of breeds in the largest group. And I went back and forth because uh, my background is like a smorgasbord. Uh, and... Um, and I finally was encouraged, just just take the group, take a group, take a group, which I ended up, I, I, I looked at where my strength was from my own experience, my own personal experience, not rep experience, but personal experience, and probably the most experience, well, it ended up, the most experience I had was in the toy group. I mean, I, uh, there were only two breeds that I had zero, I mean, Russian toy, what do I know? You know, I mean, I've since learned in toy fox terrier, I've never had my hands on that um, until I was in a ring. Um, but I took the toy group, which also gave me the opportunity to have poodles. Poodles for sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's what I'm up to, Will. Very good, very good. 
Um, I have two more questions. I have more, right? but I'm going to go this way. Since you wore, you've worn a few hats. If someone came to you and asked you for advice on becoming a professional handler, if you couldn't talk them out of it, what would you do? <laughs> what would you say to them? <laughs> if I couldn't talk them out of it is what you yeah. said. <laughs> I I would tell them in a way shorter order what I just told you. You got to find a good handler and work for them an apprentice. You know, when I was a when I was a, a handler and then a, a rep um, um, and a member of the registered handler AKC registered handler program, I put on a lot of junior clinics. Mm -hmm. um, at shows. And it wasn't just, you know, running around a ring teaching. Yes, we did that. And the, and the clubs would shut down and we'd have handlers come in and, you know, take a couple of kids and, and train them. But beyond that, afterwards, we'd sit them down, give them lunch, and I'd always have a guest speaker. And somebody like, like Carissa, I mean, who better, you know, this is what you should do. If this is going to be your profession, this is what you should do. This, 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 this. That was constantly put at them. Um, do this. The only running around the ring is the end result. It's the simplest thing, you know, blah, blah, blah. Hold pooper scoopers for a year or two, you know, and, and then we'll get you in a ring. Hard to do in this day and age of everything happening so quick. Yeah, the social media, you know, I won this, I won this, I won this, I won this. You do see some really good assistants, apprentices out there, like digging in and learning the skill and honing their skill. But I, I would do a deep dive, if anyone asked, into that. The other thing I do do... Um, because clearly working in this area for a long time, you see, you see, and, and as a rep, I'd always head to the junior showmanship ring I was supposed to. And you'd see the, the good ones, you know, the one, the, the authentic ones. And you see them go from novice to open, and then all of a sudden they're about to age out. And what I would do is, and they knew my spiel about working for a handler. If they're going to stay in, they got to work for a handler, not junior showmanship, hang your shingle and run around a ring and win pretty ribbons. But I also encourage them to judge junior showmanship. So what I would do, and as a matter of fact, I just gave one out last week, and I would buy them a judge's badge. And all of the authentic juniors, the sincere ones, the ones who truly have, a, in my opinion, have, truly have a future in this sport, who are doing it for the right reason, who don't have an ego, who really want to learn dogs and dog shows. And I would encourage them to become junior showmanship judges. And I'd buy them a badge with their name on it. And here's your badge. You know, now, now fill out the paperwork and, and get in there and pay it forward to the next generation. You know, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a little way. It's a little encourager. It's also amazing how, you don't know what kind of a home life they have. It's also you know, when, when they hear the word, even from somebody like me, that I'm proud of you, you, you should see their faces. You know, you don't know what kind of encouragement or discouragement they're getting from home or whatever. And it, it was always, it, it gave me a warm, fuzzy feeling to, to see that expression on their face and to see, see and, and know that somebody was watching them. Somebody was encouraging them and watching them week after week after week. Not in a Will Alexander stalker way, but <laughs> and that's a whole nother story, folks. <laughs> He'll have to tell you. <laughs> but but you know, you try to make little dents here and there. That was my little dent. That was a big dent. It was good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, what's, you know, a pin is a pin is a pin. Yeah, no, yeah. And that's what I do. That's how I roll, Will. <laughs> I knew that. <laughs> um, judges. What if someone said they wanted to be a judge? Oh, yeah. That's a hard one for, you mean, as a junior or for anyone? No, uh, any, any, if any exhibitor that's been around or even a handler would come yeah. to me. Yeah. I, I, I'm thinking about being a judge. 
Yeah, I mean, Idol was obviously, you know, if I if I knew you, I, I kind of would know your background. But if it's somebody just walking up and you do see them and it's like, oh, geez, you don't deserve to wear a badge for see me in 20 years, maybe, yeah. you know, but but. I, I asked them, okay, what's your background? And when the background was a little slim, well, uh, you know, I'd say, oh, yeah, no. See, that person, that person has been handling and breeding for 20 years. See, that person, that person was doing this, 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 and this. I'd point out people and, and say, are you up to the same level of, of judging breeds as you honestly, do you honestly believe that? I, I rarely encouraged Will. I rarely did. I mean, there's always exceptions to the rule, you know, but, but so many people, even the current judges, you know, some are doing it for the right reason. Some are doing it for the free lunch. Some are doing it because they want to get on a plane and go to Montana and see the big sky. I mean, you know, you know there's so many, re- you know, so many reasons why they're doing it. Um, but I, I kind of get their background, weed that, weed through that. And since they asked me, I tell them, yeah, if they were nowhere near ready. I'd say, yeah, nowhere near ready. What are you kidding me? You, you've, you had one litter, and you think you can go in there? Yeah, no. Why do you want to go in a ring and look like a dope? Yeah, no. so yeah. But I it, obviously that's up to them, and that's what the reps do best: find the dopes and say stop that. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one more question. I'm nervous. If this is one more question, I'm nervous. This could send me flying backwards. Wait, let me take a gulp. (laughs) Hit me, Will. Patty, if you were to meet the 20-year-old Patty, is there any advice you'd give her now? I gotta say, I gotta say, I gotta say no, I truly don't, don't have a regret, Will. I'm sure I could have done tweak things here and there or whatever. Um, but that was just kind of me rolling through life. Um, no, I, I have to I have to credit growing up on Long Island, which sounds so funny, but I have to credit growing up on Long Island um, with a good gut sense. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm I was lucky with that. Um, but no, I, I don't have regrets. I don't. I'm, uh, maybe other, maybe close friends would say, what are you nuts? I shouldn't have done this, this, and this, and that, blah, 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 blah. But, um, no, my conscience is pretty clean. I don't know. Watch. We're going to get off of this. I'm going to say, oh, my God, I should have told him I never should have done this. <laughs> well, you can call me later. <laughs> I'll call you. Add this in, please. Um, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't have told her, you know, just keep keep your head on your shoulders. Keep your head on your shoulders, shoulders and, and be aware, which I believe I was. Doesn't mean I was perfect, the Lord knows, audience. Doesn't mean I was perfect in any way, shape, or form. Um, But I kind of just rolled with the punches, a lot of punches, and um, um, left them behind or, or, or tweaked them or moved them forward. But no. Oh, good. Yeah. 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 So and I'm so glad we got we finally got to do this. This was great. This was great. Uh, yeah, you I've know, been here for a while. <laughs> I know, and my fault, my fault, my fault. And and I gotta say, uh, I was telling a friend just last night. It's like I'm not gonna be nervous, and I totally trust Will and whatever he's saying. But I'd hate to be boring. I'd hate to be boring. Yeah, you know. Right yeah. Now. Uh, uh, hey, if I could tell the Babby Tongren story, I guess. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> God bless her and Bob Wills and uh, yeah, Buzzy and all of us. And guess what? I'm the only one left to tell it. So there you go. So it needs to be told. So we need to there, there it is. Yeah. There it is. Yes, that AKC director broke an AKC rule or two or three or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, I'm seeing you at the show. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but thank you for this, Will. I, I, you know, I'm a huge fan, and I enjoyed this. And um, thank you. It was great catching up with you. Now I'm sure I'll see you somewhere. So. I hope so. <laughs> I'll be around. You will be. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Will. Thanks, Patty. I knew it would be. Um, if you like what you're seeing here, make sure you press the like, share, and subscribe button. Don't forget, if you want to find out about what's happening in Will's world, go to willalexander.net. Any messages, go to dogshowtips at gmail.com. And don't forget about the podcast every Thursday, uh, the Dog Show Drive with myself and Wayne Kavanaugh. Later, guys. 